Good evening and welcome to Hard Fire. I'm your host, Joseph Dobrian, and we're here for another half hour of conversation and debate from a libertarian perspective. Now, the um, primary elections in the state of New York are history, and uh, both the Demoblican and the Republican parties have uh, got their slates set. And um, in a few cases, we've got libertarian candidates running against them. And in a few cases, we've got libertarians who are running both on our ticket and on one of the other major tickets. And one of those is with me in the studio tonight. I'd like to introduce Dr. Steve Finger, the um, congressional candidate in the 11th congressional district of um, the state of New York, which covers a good portion of Brooklyn. Um, Dr. Finger is running on both the Republican and the Libertarian tickets. And um, Dr. Finger, uh, the 11th district is, is quite an historical district, isn't it, for a number of reasons. Maybe you can give us a little background about the district that you hope to represent. Well, the 11th congressional district was actually created by the Voting Rag Rights Act as a minority district. Uh, it was supposed to be, the district is approximately 60% uh, African American and was, uh, was made that way so that they would have a, an African American representative. Uh, and people question why a white candidate would run and should he run. And my feeling about that is that the whole concept of creating minority districts really works to the detriment of the African American community. And this is the reason. Uh, there is a tendency that under the Voting Rights Act to group all the African Americans together, put 60% in one district, and the point of that is to have an African American representative in Congress. But what I think should have been done instead would be to divide the African community into three and have 20% African Americans in each of three congressional districts. Now, if that were the case, uh, the African American representation in Congress might go down but they would have a lot more power. And the reason being, in most elections, most elections, the swing vote is approximately 5%. Now, if you had 20%, 20% of African Americans in three districts, you, you might have a lesser representation, but you would have control over three times the number of congressional representatives. So what's happened in essence, and unfortunately, this, the, the, the black community was complicit in this, is uh, we, have more, you'll, you, we have more representatives, but only one-third, only one-third, in essence, um, representation in Congress. Because if we had split up the, the district into three, the African-Americans would, would be 20% of three districts, they would be the swing vote in three districts, and they would control three times the number of Congress, uh, Congress representation that they have now. Okay, well, uh, setting aside the prag pragmatic aspects, um, I'm curious as to the um, uh, idea, I'm curious about the idea that uh, a white man shouldn't be running in these districts, that these districts should be um, reserved, as it were, for, for black people. So what's a honky like you doing running in this district? I'm honking. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, for the reason that I just explained, I, I, don't, I think these districts were created to the detriment of the community. and. Uh, I'm running because I believe the ideas that I'm putting forward are really better for this community and they're better for the, uh, better for the state and better for the country as a whole. So there's really no reason not to run. Okay, so uh, what, why should the people of the 11th district in particular vote for a fellow like you who is certainly not a Democrat and certainly not to be classified as a modern day liberal? Well, I think the main reason they should vote for me is because the main thing that I'm interested in doing for the 11th Congressional District and for the rest of the country as a whole is promoting the concept of school choice. I think the most important thing that we can do for our children is to give them a decent education. And while there are many children who go to excellent public schools and get a decent education, there are also many who do not. And they're trapped in those schools. Uh, and we, as many people don't realize, the public schools, the government schools, are very, very expensive. We spend approximately twelve to fifteen thousand dollars per year on each child. And I think that the kids would get a much better education if they had the option to take some of that money and instead of spending it in the public schools, take it to the school of their choice. 
There are many people who advocate making the public schools better, making the public schools stronger, and nobody would quarrel with that. But it just seems that over the years we've finally come to the realization that the government doesn't always know how to make them better and how to make them stronger. And each year that, that the, the chancellor is trying to make it better or stronger or whatever they're doing, uh, each kid loses one year of an education. And I think we should give them a chance to get out of those schools, let them find a decent public school, let them have a decent education, let the public schools improve. They'll probably improve more because there'll be some competition. They'll have to compete for these kids. And when the public schools get as good as they should be, the kids can always go back. But in the meantime, uh, we, we just can't, we can't jettison these children and give them, uh, let them go out in a life with no education. Okay. Now, you are both the Republican and the Libertarian candidate in this election, and uh, a lot of Libertarians, I think, would dispute you on the idea that we ought to have public schools at all. Why not just privatize the whole mess? Maybe someday, but I, I'd like... Um, Looking, I'd like to see things get better in this life, on this planet, in this world. And we're not going to abolish public schools overnight. I think it's an accepted concept that the federal, that the government, that the government is going to be paying for education. And the only question is what kind of an education and how they pay for it. We're not going to get rid of public schools, not yet. Now, if it turns out that the that we do have a voucher program or the or a, uh, a tax credit program and that most people do prefer private education and that gradually, gradually they take their kids out of the public schools and put them in private schools and the public schools are allowed to wither because nobody wants them anymore. Uh, I don't think that's a very terrible thing. They, you know, there are, there, are, there are two things involved in every government action. One is paying for it and the other one is providing it. Uh, and in most instances, the government does one or the other. It's only education, they do both uh, with, with medicine uh, the government has decided that they're going to provide medical care for the poor and for the, uh, for the elderly, for the senior citizens, and they get a card and they go out to private doctors uh, who provide the, edu the medical care for them. If they want food, they get food stamps and they go to private grocers who buy, clo buy food from private middlemen, which is grown by private farmers, and they get their food. The government doesn't run the farms, doesn't run the supermarkets, and I think that we're a lot better off with a situation like that. Okay, now uh, you had mentioned uh, medical care. You are, in fact, a doctor of medicine, correct? Yes, I am. Um, and um, how would you um, change the uh, system of health care for your constituents if you were elected to Congress? Well, it's a difficult problem. It's a difficult problem. The first thing that I would do, though, is to change a situation that most people are not aware of. I think most people don't realize that it's illegal. The government has made it illegal for a resident of one state to purchase health insurance in another state. That means if you live in New York and you want to buy health insurance from a company in Utah or a company in Connecticut, you're not allowed to do that. And the effect of that is that the... Why not, for heaven's sake? Well, it shouldn't be that way. But the legislatures, the legislatures of each state uh, regulate the, the insurance that's sold, and they, they uh, put mandate after mandate upon the insurance company. So for instance, a company like New York, which feels that everything should be included, might, state that it might force the insurance companies to pay for chiropractic care, for drug treatment, for alternate medicine, for vitamins, for whatever they feel. And while that's very desirable for people that want to avail themselves of these services, it adds to the cost. And people that don't want those services have to pay for them anyway. And if every citizen were to be allowed to purchase insurance in another state, they could look around the country and find insurance uh, at the price they wanted to pay at a more reasonable price and buy the kind of insurance they want. And I think that would bring down the price quite a bit. I think that would be a, a good first step. Okay. What do you say to the idea that it's the responsibility of the government to provide health care to each citizen? I don't think it's the government's responsibility to provide health care for each citizen. First of all, the government itself doesn't actually provide the health care. Congressmen are not actually uh, doing, doing the health care, providing themselves. What they're doing is they're forcing some citizens to pay for the health care of other citizens. And I think that's a, that's a poor idea because, first of all, I think it's just in general people should be able to take care of their own, their own health care. Um, and uh, government doesn't usually do a very good job of that. 
In the instances where people cannot afford health care and cannot afford to take care of themselves, I think private charities have been shown to be much more effective and uh, much more efficient than government ever was. So I, I don't think we have the right to ask some people to pay for the health care for others. And I think when government tries it, it does it very expensively and very inefficiently. We should stop it. Okay, well, uh, let's not sugarcoat it. We're not asking people to pay for other people's health care. We are forcing them to pay for other people's well, health care. Okay. Um, and speaking of medical issues, another one of your pet issues is the use of medical marijuana. Can you explain what it is that you advocate and how that may differ from the Democrat position? Right. Well, the Democrats uh, sometimes agree with us. Uh, we're not, we, we, we do overlap. Uh, libertarians and Republicans sometimes can make common cause with Democrats, and whenever we do, uh, we should take advantage of that. But basically, the issue with mar medical marijuana is that uh, a number of states, Arizona, California, and several, several others, have passed voter initiatives uh, to allow the use of medical marijuana. And what that would mean is that with a doctor's prescription, a patient could obtain marijuana and use it legally. And it was most effective with terminally ill cancer patients who have terrible nausea and vomiting from the chemotherapy, and that's been shown to be help with marijuana. Uh, AIDS patients uh, also get a, uh, have their, their um, appetite is Im improved with the use of medical marijuana. And for reasons that still escape me, the federal government has taken it upon itself to, uh, to prohibit that, to go into the states, even the states that overwhelmingly were in favor of med medical marijuana, and to, uh, to prosecute, to prosecute people who were complying with state law. Uh, in the last Congress, there was a bill introduced uh, which was called something like the, uh, the Patient's Right to Medical Marijuana Act, and it was unfortunately defeated. Uh, that act would prohibit the federal government by, from overruling the will of each individual state and allow the states to make the decision for themselves. If I were elected, I would be a co-sponsor and a s strong supporter of a law like that. Okay, and how would you feel about legalization of marijuana and other drugs for recreational purposes? Well, I, I think we have to take it one step at a time. I think medical marijuana is a fairly non-controversial thing. Uh, I think the way drugs should be dealt with is the same way that alcohol has been dealt with. You know, uh, we had prohibition in this country and uh, we had prohibition with the 18th Amendment, and the 21st Amendment uh, over withdrew the, the 18th Amendment. It didn't make alcohol legal. It didn't make alcohol legal. What it did was get the federal government out of the picture and leave the decision to each individual states. And in fact, uh, Mississippi, Mississippi was the last state to become dry. In 1966, Mississippi finally withdrew their prohibition of alcohol and they allowed alcohol to be sold freely but regulated so that children wouldn't be allowed to have that. And I think the advantage of that would be several fold. First of all, we have a huge uh, DEA with, uh, with many very well trained and very capable agents who were being wasted, breaking into people's houses, uh, interfering with the use of marijuana or other drugs. Uh, these guys could be used, and, and women, they could be used in the fight on terror. They're very well-trained people. If we get the federal government out of the drug business, uh, these people could be used as agents to fight the terrorist cells that we know exist in this country. Uh, and it should be basically a, an issue that's left to the states. We all have our own view about the, the, um, uh, the value of uh, uh, using drugs and the value of prohibiting it. But this, to me, is a state's right issue. which should not be decided by the federal government. Okay. Now, um, as far as um, states' rights are concerned, um, I uh, understand that you advocate term limits for uh, congressmen. Now, would this be on the federal level, or would this be uh, on the state-by-state -state level? And what sort of term limits do you advocate, and why? Well, term limits by, for mm -hmm. Congress is naturally on the federal level, level because uh, Congress is a, is a federal institution. So term limits for Congress would be to limit the term of uh, congressmen. Uh, representatives and senators. Uh, the value for this is that it seems that the longer representatives, the longer congressmen stay in office, the bigger spenders they become. And 10 years seems to be the, the, the tipping point. People that have been in Congress more than 10 years become co-opted by the spending uh, environment in Washington and the spending goes, gets out of sight. 
Uh, we, we have term limits for the president. We have term limits on local levels for many councilmen and states. Well, now that them. argument sounds like, but ma, everyone else is doing it. That doesn't hold water for me. I think people should be able to vote for whoever the hell they want to vote for, whether well, we like them or not. I think that you're right. I think you're sure right. And people should be allowed to vote for a constitutional amendment to have term limits. And if they vote for that, then that would be, then that would institute term limits. I, don't, I wasn't saying that we should do it for congressmen because we do it for other people. I was just trying to point out that it's not such a radical idea. Okay. But uh, by limiting the terms that a person can serve in public office, are you not attainting that individual? Saying, attainting you, them? Steve Finger, yeah. having served time in Congress, are now ineligible, unlike all other citizens of the United States, to run for Congress. Well, I guess I'm doing that. I guess I'm doing that. I think that uh, I think it would be advantageous to have uh, congressmen to have to bring back the concept of citizen legislators, which means that you go to the you go to Washington, you serve a few years, and then you come back and you have to live under the laws that you passed. But I, maybe that should be the individual's choice, and if your constituents don't like you, they can kick you out, right? Well, you're a hundred percent right. But by the same token, it would be the individual's choice as to whether or not to have an amendment to have term limits. So I, on, at one point, I, I, understand that, I understand your point, but it, it's not so easy to pass a constitutional amendment. I think if citizens want to do that, that should be their right. Okay. Uh, do you think it could vary from state to state? Like, for example, the state of Oregon could impose term limits on its congressmen, but the state of Minnesota could reelect them as often as they like? I don't think you could do that <clears> because <throat> the terms of, con of congressmen and senators are set by the U.S. Constitution, and to change that would require an amendment to the United States Constitution. It's not a, it's not a local issue. Okay. Um, now, let's get back for a moment to the um, specific district that you propose to represent. Um, if you're elected, you would supposedly be depriving the um, black community of one of their representatives. Um, do you feel that it holds any, um, any water, really, that uh, uh, certain races should be um, given a certain proportion of representation or at least uh, given a, the opportunity? You mentioned uh, the business of, well, the pragmatic problems with uh, dividing up districts. But do you think that in, as a general thing, it's good to apportion congressional representation by race or ethnicity? No, I don't think that's a good idea. I, I, don't, I don't think, I don't, it's a tough question to answer. I, I don't think that it should be done the way it's done now. Um, I, I, I don't know how you apportion these districts. I think that, that, to, that the way we have a situation now where districts are made to be predominantly black or predominantly any other ethnic group, I think is a bad idea for the reasons that I explained previously, that I think it dilutes the strength of the ethnic group, which is, which is presumably being helped by putting them all together on one congressman or having them elect one congressman, where if they would divide it into three or four groups, they could be the swing group with several, with several congressmen. Mm -hmm. I think the whole premise, to my mind, is rather insulting to these various ethnic groups because it implies that they vote monolithically without thinking that there's just sort of a herd mentality. And that may be, but it's not the sort of thing you want to uh, take for granted, is it? Well, I, I don't think that uh, any ethnic group votes monolithically, but there are certain, certain issues that are more important to each particular ethnic group. Uh, that's un inescapably true. Okay, so you're saying that um, uh, perhaps a uh, libertarian society or libertarian issues might appeal to one race but not to another? Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, I think libertarian issues at base uh, appeal to virtually everybody except people who are benefiting by the distorted type of government that we have now. Um, I, I think, for instance, my major issue is school choice. I think school choice would be beneficial to kids who are going to school, to children in school. Uh, it might be opposed by the teachers' unions, which have something to lose by this. They, they see it as a threat to their jobs. But schools are not a job creation program. The purpose of schools is not to create jobs for the teachers. It's to help eventually to get jobs for the students by giving them a decent education. Okay, now um, 
I have a feeling that a lot of your potential constituents don't know a lot about the Libertarian Party or what they've been told about it might often be mistaken. Can you boil down to just a few words what the principles of libertarianism are and maybe explain to your voters that uh, you, you might just be the right man for the job? Well, I think libertarian, first of all, I, I would like to stress again that I'm running on, on two parties. I'm running as a libertarian and a Republican. Well, yes, and, but I'm a libertarian, so it's my job to uh, flog that issue. Okay, okay, <laughs> I understand that. I was, I was going to point out that at one time Republicans were much more libertarian than they are now. And they've moved away from that much to our detriment. Uh, I think that uh, my view of libertarianism is that individuals have the right to live their life as they see fit to the greatest extent, which means the, the least impingement upon their lives by the government. Um, smaller government, lower taxes, people having the right to live their own life. It doesn't mean anarchy. It doesn't mean no government. I believe that the government does have a, have a place in this society and in every society. I think government should be establishing order, should be establishing uh, a certain amount of, um, of justice, uh, that, that people should be allowed to walk the streets, they should be able to open a business, and the legal system, the accounting system are all very important functions of government. Okay. There are going to be a lot of people in your district, though, I predict, who are going to say, but the government should be in the business of leveling the playing field, re redistributing the wealth, uh, making things a little fairer for everybody, and uh, maybe taking from those who have a lot and giving to those who have little. What's your view on that? Well, I think part of that stems from the view that, that kids get, uh, the education that kids get as far as economics in school, where people that take the, the view that you're expressing here, uh, imagine that there's a huge pot of money and there's a, a huge pie and it has to be split up amongst people. And if some people get more, then other people of necessity have to get less. But that's really not correct. The, the, the riches, the, the affluence of a society is not the amount of money. It's the goods and services that are produced. And the money is the way that, that these goods and services are exchanged and the way they're valued. Uh, and if some people produce more valuable goods and more valuable services, it's not to the disadvantage of the people who are poor. The fact that Henry Ford invented an automobile and began a whole industry that, and became fabulously wealthy, it didn't impoverish anybody. In fact, it, it enriched people. It may have impoverished some people. It impoverished people who were making money from horse and buggy. But the country as a whole was enriched because this whole automobile industry was produced, was, was pushed out into the economy. And that's what made this country such a rich country. That's, and it's not, it's not that there's something there that's static and that it has to be divided up. It's, there's an economy that's, that millions of people are, making it, are, are producing something to make it affluent. And if they produce more and if their services are more valued uh, and if they become affluent, it's not at the expense of the poorer people. That's never been the case, that rich people get rich by making poor people poor. Okay. But uh, now you brought up uh, Ford, and that brings up the uh, subject of corporations generally. Uh, there are a lot of people who tell you that um, the idea of corporate welfare, that is the government helping corporations that are in need, uh, is actually a pretty good idea because it keeps a lot of people from going on unemployment. Um, what do you say to the whole idea of corporate welfare? And if you don't think that there should be any, what would be the alternative? Well, the alternative to corporate welfare is no corporate welfare. Um, when we talk about corporate welfare, what we're basically talking about is helping corporations at the expense of taxpayers. Um, many of us realized that in 1996, we eliminated, to a large extent, uh, welfare for poor people. We, we, we said that pe people who were in welfare at one time and felt entitled to it are no longer entitled to welfare. We'll help them, but then it's not an entitlement. They're not entitled to welfare. And I think we should use that as a model for corporations. I don't think that we have to continue to bail out corporations for making bad investments. I don't think we have to keep on backing their bonds. Um, one of the things that people talk about now is investing in energy, investing in energy as though it's something that government must do. And it, it shouldn't be that way. The government should not be giving corporations money or helping corporations, uh, oil companies, to go out and, and, and prospect for oil. 
These companies should be allowed to go out and do the prospecting that they want. If they're successful, then they should reap the rewards and not be subject to all sorts of demagoguery, such as win windfall profits tax. And on the other hand, if they're not successful, then they should take their losses and not expect the taxpayer to, to, to back up their losses. Because, you know, we talk about helping, co helping corporations. What we don't see is the people that are hurt. Government doesn't actually help, doesn't enhance anything. What government does is it transfers. So if one corporation is helped, it's by taking money from somebody else. And we, we see the visible effects. We see the corporation that's helped. We don't see the people that, that are hurt. And I think basically it's a bad policy. Uh, we, should not be, we should not be helping corporations to invest. We shouldn't be backing their bonds. We should provide what the, our obligation to corporations and to every business is to provide a decent and stable business environment, an environment where people can start businesses and can prosper in this country. And that's what made this country so great and made it so, so prosperous. Okay, and do you think that if we follow the policy of that sort, uh, would that uh, encourage the growth of business and employment in your district specifically? Well, I, I think it would encourage business throughout the country. I think it's a good policy for business in general. What some people have, have uh, suggested is that within an, uh, a district like mine, which is a very depressed district, uh, we might experiment with the idea of enterprise zones, where, there is, where in this area we alleviate some of the tax burden and some of the regulatory burden that businesses have to uh, contend with. And that might, uh, it might be a, a situation where we could enhance the businesses in that district and see what happens. Let a, let a thousand flowers bloom. Okay, that's great. And um, <clears throat> we certainly do hope that you will have the opportunity to uh, water those flowers in uh, the next two years as you represent uh, the 11th Congressional District in the United States House of Representatives. If um, you are more interested in, if you're interested in knowing more about uh, Dr. Steve Finger's congressional campaign, or if you would like to contribute uh, your time, your money, or other resources to his campaign, not asking for money. Visit his uh, website. It's www.fingerforcongress.org. And um, Dr. Steve Finger, thank you very much for uh, being on our show tonight, and we wish you all the luck in the world in your upcoming campaign. And uh, we expect to see you in Washington for the next two years. Thank you very much. And, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for visiting us tonight. And we hope to see you on the next edition of Hardfire. I'm Joseph Dobrian. Take care. Good luck. <laughs>